Mark's Gospel today, chapter 14, and we're going to talk a little bit about denying Jesus. Certainly no one would deny Jesus the Christ. We're Christians and we're going to stand on what's right and what's, what we understand to be Christian values, and no one would ever deny Jesus Christ. Uh, certainly we wouldn't even deny who we are. Uh, we know who we are. We know what family we belong to. We have our last names in this country. Uh, uh, you go back to Yazoo County where I'm from and you go out to a little town called Benton, Mississippi and you ask around about some Mays, M-A-Y, and they would tell you, uh, uh, yeah, we know the Mays. And you dig deep enough and, uh, and they would say, well, what would you want to know about them? And, and I heard you were digging around. I'd tell you to get away from over there. Uh, you'd find out more than I want you to know, okay? Uh, but I would not deny that I'm a May. I would not deny I belong to Jesus the Christ because He has saved me and He has made me whole. But do we oftentimes deny Jesus Christ? Are there ways and are there events in our lives that would cause us to deny who we are as Christians? Notice the passage of Scripture beginning in Mark's Gospel, chapter 14, verse 66. I apologize, I still have a little of this, I guess, head cold and bronchitis that I have. I ask that you stand out of respect to the reading of God's Word. Mark 14, verse 66. Now as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. And he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you are saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, This is one of them. But he denied it again. And a little later, those who stood by said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them. For you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. But he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And a second time the rooster crowed. And Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come here today humbled before you. Lord, seeking to please you and understanding that we're not perfect people. And Father, we put our faith and our trust in you each and every day. And Lord, we often fail you. And Lord, today we come seeking to understand why we fail you. And Father, we ask that you reveal yourself in a mighty way and show us the truth so that we become stronger Christians, so that we can make a difference in people's lives. Oh, Father God, be good to us today. Love us only as you can. Give us strength and give us courage to face the battles. Thank you, God. For it's in your Son's name we pray. You may be seated. I want you to think about something today. I want you to realize that there's some theology going on in this passage of Scripture that we read. And what I want you to think about is this, that every person, every person born into this world is what we call totally depraved without Christ. Every person. We begin to get older and, and as children we begin to, to speak. And we begin to say things that just sometimes make us grit our teeth as parents. We begin to see our children in daycare, nurseries, 
And they begin to fight over toys that are not theirs, and they begin to say things like, mine. And they know it's not theirs. And it just continues to build. And we begin to realize that there's something wrong with people. Why do we act like that? We get older, God intervenes in our life, we come to know Christ as our personal Lord and Savior, and now we're saved, we are redeemed, we have a new nature, we become new creatures in Christ, we walk in a new life. We are ordained to good works. Yet we live in a body of fallen flesh. That's what Paul says. We're weak. And I want you to know, and I want you to look at the slides. If you take notes, you need to write this down. We do have a redeemed soul, but a fallen body. And every Christian lives in a dangerous place. Every day we get up, it's a dangerous place we live in. Every morning we wake up to a very critical, dangerous, spiritual battle. Not once a week. Not once a month, not twice a year, but every morning we wake up to a very dangerous spiritual battle. And the decisions we make are critical. They're critical to how we live our life for Christ. And when we begin to make wrong decisions, it is a domino effect. One wrong decision leads to another wrong decision, which leads to another wrong decision, which leads to another wrong decision. And how in the world do we end up way over here when we should be over there? Something has happened. How do we get to here? How do we get here? Because we woke up And we decided we were going to make the wrong decisions. It's a critical battle. It's a hard battle. And we're looking at Peter. Redeemed. Redeemed. Saved by the grace of God. You know, I was thinking about old Peter. And I was thinking about why do Christians fall? Why do Christians fall? I mean, I sat at my desk at home one evening. Well, one night, it was about 11 o'clock. And I began to wonder, how can Christians fall like that? I mean, here's Peter. And you you look at Peter and, and all that Peter has gone through, how could he fall? What did Peter know? Three years with Christ. I mean, who is Peter? He he was in a boat, y'all remember? He was in the boat on the sea in a storm and he looks out and Jesus is walking on the water. And everybody's so afraid. And what does Peter say? Call me Jesus and I'll come out there. And as far as I know, there's only been two people to walk on water. Isn't that right? Who were they? Jesus and who? Jesus 
and Peter. And Jesus said, come on, Peter. And what did Peter do? He stepped out. He made the right decision. And he got out on the water and he walked on water. He got out there. He's feeling good. And he looked around. And he began to think. And you got to stay with me. Look at what I've done. It's pride. It's pride. Me and Jesus. Look at where I am. Look at what I've accomplished. And then he began to look at the water. Then what happened? And down he goes. And the Bible says, Pride goeth before the fall. And he went down. But you know what's great about that? The God of the universe, the Savior of my soul and your soul as you belong to Christ, reached down with grace and mercy and lifted Him up. Lifted Him up. We come to the text, and it's just a short text. It didn't take me long to read that text, did it? But it's a two-hour period. Those few verses covered two hours of what's going on. Peter's out there for two hours. It's not just a a three-minute little read or a one-minute read, whatever it took. It's two hours worth of event. Peter's out there sweating for two hours. He walks to the fire. He's standing there. The girl confronts him. He goes to the porch. He's sweating. Oh, they know who I am. He's confronted again. He denies it. He's confronted again. Two hours worth of sweat. You know what that'll give you? Give you heartache. Give you an upset stomach. It'll give you heartburn. That's that's what they call stress. You know why? He had pride. Pride. So let's look at it. It's going to be short, so I want you to stay with me. We're going to look at the first point. The first point is called Peter's story. And here's Peter's story. He's part of the inner circle. You know, there's 12 of them, but he's part of that little group. He's part of the little group that goes up on the mountaintop and sees the transfiguration. He's part of that group that that Jesus relies on heavily. He's the one that makes the great statement that you are the Son of God on which the church shall be built. He's the one that Jesus says, Satan wants to test you, Peter. He's the one that makes the statement, I will never, ever, never, if you will, betray you, Jesus. Even if I die, I will not betray you, Jesus. And that's pride. So let me show you a verse. And go to 1 Corinthians. If you have your Bible, you need to turn there. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Peter's a prideful person. Do you know who are the most prideful people in the world? Do you know who are considered by the rest of the world to be the most prideful people in all of the world. You're in the group. People in the United States are considered to be the most prideful people in all of the world. That's us. We are prideful. I'll take it a step further. I believe that the people in the South are more prideful than anybody else. 
You, Chris, am I scaring you? Chris says, Brother Andy, you get right on the edge and you become top heavy. You want to know, I can prove that we're prideful. How many of y'all love your Mississippi State Bulldogs? Yeah. How many of you like your Golden Eagles? How about them old Miss Rebels? Man, we saw her, ain't we? We're prideful people. Notice what 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12 says. Well, I just love this verse. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he what? Faults. You break it down, and here's the key word. Let him who thinks. It's a mindset. You think you're something. That's what Paul, let everyone who thinks you're something be careful because you're going to take a terrible fall. It's pride. And Paul had to deal with Peter. And Paul said, I had to rebuke him to his face. Even after all it's over and said and done and Jesus goes back to heaven, Paul still had to deal with with a prideful Peter. Let me tell you this as well though. He loves Christ. He loves truth. He wants to be obedient. He wants to honor God. He wants all of that. He really does. But you know what? He thinks, I can do this. I can. I can do this. Here's Peter's stupidity. Verse 66, it says he was in the courtyard. And he says there was the look. The maid looked at him. The servant looked at him. And then there was a lie. He began to deny Christ. Began to tell people what they wanted to hear. He made up a story to fit what he wanted, to keep him where he wanted to be. So he leaves there and he goes to the porch. Then there's a louder voice. She began to lift up her voice. And then there's another lie. And the lies begin to build. Then the bystanders hear it and they make a charge. Then there's cursing because now he's upset, calling his hand at what's going on. And he's really, really upset. Then you come to the very last verse and there's great sorrow. And his great sorrow. He remembered. And he wept. Luke 22 tells us, when you heard that old rooster crow the second time, Luke records that Jesus could see him. And he looked into Peter's eyes. And I want you to know Christ is looking into your eyes. He knows exactly what's going on in your life. And He's looking into the very depths of your soul. The very depths of your soul. And He remembers when you were over here. And He remembers that you had choices to make. And you woke up one morning and you made this choice. It took you this way. And then the next morning you want a little further. And the next morning you want a little further. And the next morning you want a little further. And you just kept going this way and this way. And all of a sudden you're over here and you're like Peter. And you don't know what to do. And you begin to weep and you're in the wrong place. Now what are you going to do about it? Peter wept. 
But here's the answer. God's a merciful God and a loving God. And He says, just come back. You're my child, just come back. Just come back and make the right choices. And every morning the battle's the same. And I'm your strength, and I'm your rock, and I'm your fortress. Just come back, just come back, just come back. And you can come back, and every day you make the right choices, and you just come back, and you come back, and you come back. And one day our goal is over here, and we're going to heaven, and you just come back. And one day you'll hear me say, well done, thy good and faithful servant, come home. Come home. It's your choice. Come home. We've been busy. I've been sick. We've had surgery after surgery after surgery after surgery. It's a spiritual battle every day. It's not hard to get upset. Why me? Why me? It wouldn't be hard to say, hey, I go to church all the time. Why me? Why not you? Would you rather be somebody else? Who would you rather have your problems? Would you rather somebody else have your problems and you'd be all right? If you would, then you don't love your fellow man which means you don't love God. God's given you problems that maybe you can't handle, but He can handle them if you let Him. And I'll never tell you the problems are going to be easy. But you wake up in the morning and you make the right decision. And you don't end up over there you end up over there. Over there is the wrong way. Over here is the kingdom way. Make the right decisions. Make the right decisions. Every single day. We have to trust Jesus. Are you willing to trust Jesus today? We're going to sing a hymn of invitation. And if God's dealing with you, I want you to come. And I want you to come quickly. Just trust the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Give us the strength, Lord, not to deny you. Not to turn away from you. But to stand firm. And to choose you to be your rock in a world that's gone crazy. To let people see you through us. And every morning to get up to fight the good fight. Oh, Father God, we love you. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen.